Hi guys, this is Mrs. Foy and this is a screencast on plants and their evolution. Um, if the very title of this uh, sends feelings of boredom seeping through your brain, you are about to be very surprised. I can remember as a college student I thought plants were really boring and as a matter of fact I didn't want anything to do with them and so I majored in zoology which is the study of animals just so I wouldn't have to deal with plants. But later on in my career, thank goodness I did um, have some courses on plants and found them to be absolutely fascinating. So hopefully I can um, pass on a little bit of that wonder to you today in this lecture. If you are listening to this screencast, then you're in my class and you have access to this um, presentation. If you are not in my class and you would like access, please email me or contact me. So guys, I want you to think about um, what are the adaptations that plants would need to have to survive on newly formed land? Remember that um, plants, um, the very first photosynthesizing organisms were cyanobacteria, and they evolved into eukaryotic organisms that were photosynthesizing for billions of years ago. And this we're talking about um, in the oceans. Um, and so only about a half a billion years ago, about 500 million years ago, plants began to uh, appear on the land. So think about what kind of strategies they would be faced with in having to survive on land. You can pause this video just for a minute and just try to come up with two or three challenges that you think that plants would have to have to survive on land from their origins in the water. So hopefully you came up with some of these. First of all, just drying out on land would be one problem. They need some protection from that. Um, being able to reproduce. Uh, plants can't move, so getting sperm to the eggs um, would require some help because they can't float. Um, they're anchored on land, um, and they need to be able to stay there so wind doesn't blow them over, etc. They have to compete for sunlight, so that's going to be important. Support for growing on land. In other words, they're fighting gravity, so they're not floating in water, so they need some structural support. They need to be able to get water and nutrients, so they've got transportation issues, and they need to protect their offspring. So hopefully you came up with a couple of those challenges, and by the end of the screencast, hopefully you can point to what plants the adaptations plants have to overcome these problems. So if you look at the evolution of major plant groups, um, what I hope you can see is I hope you can see, well, here are the origins of land plants back about 500 million years ago. And all plants uh, evolved from ancestral green algae. And the very first land plants were very primitive um, little small organisms um, that we call the bryophytes. The most important group for us today are the mosses. So those would be um, groups that you know today. Mosses grow, of course, in moist places. They're very low to the ground. Those are, those are the mosses. And then the next major group that we're going to talk about are the pteridophytes. The pteridophytes are the ferns. Um, and those were our first vascular plants. The ferns were the first vascular plants, um, the, the major groups. I'm skipping over the ones that are not as important. I mean, you got to love club mosses, but sorry, club mosses. I'm not going to talk about you today. And then we have the two major um, extant um, seed plants, the gymnosperms and the angiosperms. And these, um, this, these, are, the, these are the seed plants. So if you look at the phylogenetic relationships between the extant, so extant means, of course, they are uh, living today, living today extant plants. Um, you can see that the mosses, the bryophytes, these liverworts as well, are very sm small, low to the ground. Um, and then we actually got roots, and, um, and, and also we have... Um, uh, uh, a vascular system that we're going to see. We're going to see a vascular system that we have with firms, ferns, and then we have the, um, the uh, evolution of seeds, which gave us the gymnosperms. Gymno means naked, naked seeds. So these are uh, pine, pine plants, like pine cone bearing plants, like uh, pine trees. And angiosperm literally means vessel seed. 
And so the seeds, instead of being naked like on a pine cone, are actually in a vessel, and that vessel is a fruit. So these are the plants that have fruits. So in order to anchor themselves on ground, living uh, plants that, that came on the land had to, had to have roots. And roots, we can see, are going to be the point of where water and minerals are absorbed. They anchor the plants and support the plants. This is where a lot of plants store um, their food and nutrients, like think of a carrot. So a carrot is a root, and um, we eat the carrot, but that's where the plant stores its nutrients. And vegetative reproduction. So if you were to take, for example, a piece of a carrot, Maybe you guys did this in elementary school, and you cut it off and you put it into um, some sand or even in a glass of water, it will grow a new carrot plant, and that's called vegetative reproduction. So this is a good time to talk about a mutualistic relationship that um, a fungi has with a lot of roots. This is a fungi. And these particular fungi have a mutualistic relationship with roots, and um, it's, a, it's a great relationship because these guys, um, these fungi actually increase the surface area. They increase the surface area of the root. You can see all these little hair-like projections here um, to increase absorption. And they get, um, the, the plant feeds the fungi um, some of the excess nutrients that are stored down there. So it's a great mutualistic relationship, um, a good one to have so as we said before, mosses were the very first effort um, for plants to live um, on the land. They're very low, they're flat to the ground. We call them a pioneering plant, call them a pioneering plant um, because they can grow on rock. They need water, however, to reproduce. And so that's what is going to be their Achilles heel as we will see. Um, as plants got more evolved, um, they um, were in competition with each other to get closer to the sun. And so the taller you were, the closer you were to the sun. And so getting bigger, little mosses were shrimpy little things living on rock. We needed to get some elevation. And so this was the development of stems. And because the, um, the leaves were far away from the roots, we needed to have some type of transportation. So we needed to be able to ship um, water and nutrients back and forth in our, um, in our vascular system, and we needed to be able to store nutrients. And um, we begin to see this new tissue called meristem. Meristem is tissue that is undergoing a lot of mitosis, rapidly dividing tissues. So we see these at the nodes. Sometimes we see it up here in the apical region. So we can see um, uh, mitosis going, uh, get, getting the plant more girth. We see it getting more height. And we also see um, a meristem regions uh, actually in the roots as well. So our ferns, the very first actual plant that has what we call a vascular system. Now vascular in the in animals would be like blood vessels, right? Like veins, you can think, and arteries. Well, in a plant, we don't have blood, so we don't have veins and arteries, but we have specialized tubes, because that's what our veins and arteries are afterwards, uh, after all. Xylem, xylem is a specialized tubing system that transport water. I think of X, Y, W, sorry, W, X, Y, and Z. So W, X, Y, and Z, I think of water, xylem. And phloem phonetically sounds like food. So, so phloem uh, is going to transport, transport sugars, sugary solutions that's made in the leaves. And xylem is going to transport water. So if you have a cartoon of what vascular tissue looks like, we can see that we have phloem. And phloem, of course, is going to transport sugars. And sugars are made in the leaves. So sugars are made in the leaves because that is where photosynthesis occurs. And so um, the phloem is going back and forth. It needs to um, 
supply the cells of the plants that are undergoing cellular respiration, right? They're burning sugar to make ATPs. That, that's going to go back and forth, okay? So phloem is going back and forth. But water is being pulled up by the roots for the vast majority of plants. And so xylem is only going up. So we got xylem transporting our tubes that transport water up, and we have phloem that's going to transport sugar or food back and forth in the phloem. So if you were to uh, take a look at the anatomy of plants, and hopefully we'll have time to do this in class, you can see a very interesting pattern of the xylem and phloem in the different parts of the leaves. By the way, the leaves and the stems and the roots are the organs of um, plants. So you can think of, you know, just like we have hearts and kidneys and livers, the leaves, stems, and roots are the organs of plants. So the xylem and the phloem bundles you can see is uh, a, in a particular pattern in the leaves. This is what it looks like in the leaves. In the stems, the pattern of the xylem and phloem tubes make a different pattern. And in the roots, the phloem and the xylem also makes a different pattern. And you can actually tell a lot by the, the classification of the plant by this pattern of xylem and phloem uh, plants. So leaves, we learned about this a little bit when we were learning about photosynthesis. Leaves are the, um, the photosynthesis factory. That is where you're going to have photosynthesis occur. You're going to have exchange, interchange of gases. So carbon dioxide is going to go in and you have excess oxygen going out of the stomata. Do you remember the plant nostrils, the stomata? We have evaporation of water on the surface of the leaves, and that evaporation of water helps to drive the transport of water up from the roots. We have storage of food. We eat a lot of leaves, okay, so lettuce artichokes, things like that are leaves. And this is also a place where you can have vegetative um, propagation. So you can take, for example, a, a piece of aloe vera leaf and you can stick it in some water and grow. So if you look at a leaf, this is a leaf um, uh, anatomy here, you can see that there is a waxy cuticle cuticle on the top, and of course this is um, to help against evaporation and drying out, which is the, the death of plants, is to, is to dry out from water. Here I have my xylem, and um, my xylem and my phloem together in what we call a vein of the plant. So I've got my xylem tube and my phloem tube. This photosynthetics products would be my phloem. And I can see that this is my stomata. So you remember the guard cells on either side of there. So CO2 going in, excess oxygen goes out. These um, palisade chlorophyll and meso um, spongy tissue are where the, um, the palisade chlorophyll cells and the spongy mesophyll cells are where the photosynthesis occurs. And those little tiny green jelly beans, of course, are the chloroplast occurs. So the net transport that you see here, remember I'm going to see my water going up from the roots, through the stems, through the leaves, and I see my, my phloem going back and forth throughout the entire plant. CO2 going in, oxygen coming out, and of course I need light to run my... So do you guys remember water potential? Well, it's back. Water potential. So water potential describes the movement of water in plants. And one of the things that we can remember is that water always moves to a lower water potential. And the way the equation is set up is that when you add solute, when you add solute, what happens is it makes the water potential more negative. So you can see the water potential in the soil is a measly negative 0.3 um, millipascals. By the time you get up to outside air, it's minus 100 millipascals. So obviously, water is going to move from low, I'm sorry, from high to low. It's going to move from high, this is higher, high to low water potential, and that is why water moves um, 
up and um, out the leaves. So we know that we have uh, cohesion and adhesion. So the craziness of those polar water molecules sticking to themselves and to the side of our tubes that we now know are our xylem tubes. Now you know the name of these. And there is a certain transport that they go through and they actually, the water molecules go out um, the stoma as well and evaporate and that's the driving force then that helps to get water up, you know, huge red, redwood trees. So you will be given in AP Biology, you are giving the equation for water potential, but just to remind you that water potential is pressure potential. This is the cell wall basically pushing back on the contents um, of the cell and solute potential that has to do with the molarity of the solution. So guys, when you look at life cycles of living things, what plants have that make them really kind of weird is they have this thing called alternation of generation. So if you look at a human and you look at um, how much time we spend in the two in condition versus the in condition, right? I mean, all of the cells of our body are in the two in condition. The only thing that is in the in condition are our gametes. So we don't have very much of our cells that are in the in condition. But what's weird about plants is plants spend about half their time in the two in condition, in the diploid condition, and about half their time in the in condition. Um, and so because they go back and forth, this is the, called the alternation of peak to plants. So what we're going to see is that we're going to see that what's interesting about this in plants is that sometimes what happens is in the haploid condition, you get a multicellular, a multicellular structure called a gametophyte. You also get a multicellular structure that uh, is 2N called a sporophyte. So keep that in mind. A sporophyte is going to produce spores and it goes through mitosis to produce a gametophyte. The gametophyte produces gametes you have fertilization, goes through mitosis, and then you have um, a sporophyte again. Look at the, um, so what is a sporophyte? Let's look at an angiosperms first, right? So an angiosperm would be what a human is to evolution in plants. They're like the top dog. So a sporophyte is the actual plant that you see. So like an oak tree would be a sporophyte. And um, in the case of an angiosperm, the gametophytes are very, very small. The microgametophyte is the pollen granule, and the megagametophyte is actually the ovule or the egg um, that is going to produce um, the egg and the sperm here. And so that's what goes to fertilization. So the dominant in angiosperm, the dominant part of the altern uh, alternation of generation is the sporophyte. But in uh, lower plants, the dominant um, life form for them is the gametophyte and the sporophyte is small and um, and insignificant. So if you look here at so you should recognize this is in this is the um, as evolution continues and we have the highest form of plants which are the amniosperms take a look at in a moss which is very primitive you have the great majority of their body is a gametophyte ferns the gametophytes gets really smaller but in seed plants and gymnosperms and angiosperms, the gametophyte is very, very small, becomes microscopic, and the uh, sporophyte becomes the larger, more dominant part of the life cycle. So a pine tree would be a sporophyte. So just a quick uh, difference between seeds and spores. I'm talking about the botanical spore here, talking about plants in botany. Spores mean something's different in microbiology when you're talking about bacteria. But for our purposes, a spore is a reproductive structure. It is single-celled. Um, it, it has no food supply. It has no protective coat. And it needs moisture to be able to uh, to grow into um, an, an adult form. Seeds are also 2N, but they are, more, more, they are multicellular. And there is, a, a, there is a baby plant or an embryo in the seed plus stored food, a food supply that the parent plant puts in there, plus a seed coat that predict, 
protects it. And so because it can lay dormant for a long time because it has a food supply, this is an advantage of seed plants. And that protective coat, of course, keeps it from drying out, and that's really important. So the seed plants have a um, advantage over spores. So the great seed plants, guys, are the gymnosperms and the angiosperms. These um, are the very first organisms to have seeds. And these guys are the first ones. These are the cone-bearing plants. Remember, gymnosperm means naked seed, so the seeds are just naked. And angiosperm means vessel seed, and the seeds are in a fruit. Not necessarily a fruit that you would eat like an apple, but a green bean is a fruit. And... Um, a pumpkin is a fruit. Is a fruit. So again, why are seeds so great? There are three parts to a seed. The embryo, which is the baby plant, stored food, which um, is why we eat so many seeds. That's why we enjoy seeds, because the stored food we're eating, and a seed coat. So um, we're going to be dissecting a seed in class, and you'll be able to see. So, um, we know that angiosperms are the top dog. They are really, really great, um, and evolutionarily speaking. And the reason why is because their seeds are protected in a fruit. And we're going to see this. A fruit is a ripened ovary. A fruit is a ripened ovary. And we're going to see where those are in the structure of, um, of the flower. So before we talk about that, let's talk about pollen. So in seed plants, the evolution of pollen was a major jump forward for plants because no longer do you need to worry about water, liquid water for fertilization. So think of primitive plants like mosses and ferns. They need moist environments. So water is still required for the egg to get to the sperm. Not so with the, adv with the ad, um, advantage of pollen. So pollen is actually the male um, gametophyte. It comes from the um, microspores. And these pollen granules um, are so light that they, um, they do not need, they, there's other ways of getting pollen to the egg, as we'll see in a minute. But water is not in this ways. And so... Um, the angiosperms are the pinnacle of evolution for plants, and fruits help disperse the seeds of, an of angiosperms. So remember, a fruit is not necessarily a sweet thing that you eat. So for example, you know those little maple, um, little helicopter things that you play with that you see coming down? Those are a fruit, all right? So not necessarily something sweet and juicy. So what happens is we can see that um, an ovary, we're going to see an ovary is in the base of the flower, and this is where the fertilized eggs grow. And as, they, as the ovary gets larger and larger, um, a lot of times if the, uh, if the strategy of the plant is to get the animal to eat it, to help disseminate its seeds, then it's going to get... Um, juicy and sweet to entice animals to eat it. Remember, the plant is actually utilizing the animal eating it to help disperse its seeds, right? Because if the animal eats the fruit, then it goes, the seeds go out into the feces and it helps. It's great. So here, guys, is an ovule in a seed. And um, you can see this is the female part. We're going to be dissecting a flower in class as well. This is the female part, the stigma style and ovary. The stigma is very sticky. This is what catches the pollen. And this is the male part of the plant that produces the sperm. And I can tell in this particular flower, this is not self-pollinizing, is it? Because there's no way that this pollen that is produced here would go up against here. If this stigma was smaller, that might be a self-fertilizing. So one of the things that happens in angiosperms is something called double fertilization. So what happens is on this carpal, or sometimes this is called a pistil, the pollen is going to, uh, to land up here, and a pollen tube actually has to grow down to where the ovule or ovary is. And the ovary um, contains an ovule that goes through meiosis once and mitosis three times to produce something that is an egg cell 
and two things called polar nuclei. These are going to end up getting fertilized by um, one pollen granule, and the egg is going to be fertilized by another pollen granule. That's why we call it double fertilization. This is going to become the embryo, and this is going to be called the endosperm. This is the stored food that the embryo is going to eat before it can photosynthesize for itself. So here we see pollinization, and we see the pollen tube growing down, and then two sperm would be delivered, one to fertilize the actual egg and one to fertilize the this is a great example of coevolution of pollinators and flowers. So here I see this beautiful hummingbird whose beak has evolved with that particular food source, the nectar that it's getting there. And of course, this is a mutualistic relationship because that pollinator is pollinating, helping to pollinate this particular type of plant. Yes, it's getting some nectar, but the plant is getting some sex life. And of course, one of the most important pollinators for humans on this earth are honeybees. And we know that honeybees are undergoing something called colony collapse disorder, which is definitely a crisis. You may not know this, but all the food that you and I eat um, is usually, a great majority of them are pollinated by honeybees. And there are people who take carts of honeybees around to farmers' fields and let them go so that it can pollinate their plants. And um, we're having a crisis with our honeybees. We're not really sure why. We don't know if it is pesticides, climate change, um, some um, mold that's growing in, in some of these, a fungi infection. So you can click on that slide. It will give you the top 10 theories behind this disorder, but definitely important. As far as seeds dispersal goes, um, we know that juicy fruits, okay, these juicy fruits are going to be um, ones that the plant wants the animals to take away. Sometimes we have um, seeds that, that are sticky and hitchhike on fur, and you know, you and I have been walking in the woods and this happened. Sometimes we have the self dispersal, that little, little, almost like little bombs that go off and pressure expels the seeds. And sometimes we have um, seed dispersal by wind. Humans and angiosperms, wow, they are the foundation of life on Earth. Um, they produce nearly our, all of our food. Yes, we eat mushrooms, um, but most of what we eat, guys, has to do with angiosperms. The great grains, corn, rice, wheat, are all in the grass family. They are angiosperms. And if you eat animals, then you're, those animals, of course, are eating angiosperms. Some of our important medicines are, are derived from, from plants, like Taxol and Vinblastine, our um, anti-cancer um, anti -cancer drugs that we got from a yew tree, and this we get from a periwinkle. Wood and wood products are made from gymnosperms and angiosperms. Remember, this is pine trees, and we use paper products and wood products from that. And although plants are a renewable resource, resource guys, plant diversity is a non-renewable resource. So if we lose the plant diversity, that's not such a good thing. So I hope this has been helpful, and I will see you guys in class.